Greetings, friends, and welcome back to porn. Mm. Or wait, more accurately, welcome back to uh, understanding porn and the effects and impact that it may have, not just on you, but on society at large. And particularly in today's video, we're going to be a little bit more concerned with that second question. In the first video, which will of course be linked below and probably here in a card or something, we talked a little bit about how pornography potentially affects the psychology, particularly when we look at long-term usage. So today, let's go back into these data. Let's answer some more of those questions. If porn affects the psyche, does that mean that on some level it can ultimately affect society at large? We went over much of the available and extant data on the effects of massive exposure to pornography on various factors though, including physiological reactions, with habituation, that means prolonged exposure to pornography over time, causing decreased heart rate and systolic blood pressure and the psychological or attitudinal reactions with higher reports of promiscuity, adultery, pain for sex, acceptance of extramarital affairs, interest in abnormal pornography, such as bestiality and sadomasochism, decreased satisfaction with romantic partners, as well as lowered sexual satisfaction overall, less desire for children and for marriage in one's life, and even a greater acceptance of wanting or allowing minors to access pornography and to allow pornography to be shown to the general public and broadcasted. Yeah, a lot of things to uh, kind of sum up there. But today, let's look at the potential social outcomes of these changes and attitudes related to exposure to pornography, including the proposed question from the SPD proposal, which again was a youth SPD proposal, and as I said, it had no real bearing on reality but was something that did get my noggin joggin, and as such is the thing I'm hanging this entire series on. Not so much as a matter of me being concerned with it, as I said, but more as, hey, here's a thing that happened, let's talk about it. So, as I just recapped, one of the things that we learned from the first video is that greater exposure to pornography has a lot of outcomes, but one of those is greater promiscuity, more extramarital affairs, cheating on your spouse, and more premarital sexual partners, as well as greater acceptance of non-traditional sexual behaviors. So let's get into what exactly that means for society at large, if it means anything at all. Cheng and Smith 2015, in a massive analysis of 3,800 Chinese people, so hey, take that potential cultural difference with a grain of salt as it may come, or a grain of rice, I suppose, in this case, <laughs> and assessed both general and specifically sexual happiness, in contrast to exposure to different kinds of life environments and relationship outcomes. I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer all the time in these videos, so let's start out with the good news. They generally found, like, wow-wee, more sex meant greater happiness. Well, imagine my shock. But hang on, it's not exactly that simple. That was the case when only analyzing having more sex with a single primary sexual partner. They also found that having more than one partner forwarded a decrease of 0.08 across the whole sample of both genders, and that that negative association decreased to a negative 0.19 when there were three or more partners involved in a relationship. In other words, yeah, more sex, more happiness, but only when you have one partner. As in contrast, having only one partner was associated positively with happiness at the level of 0.13 for the total sample. Similarly, engaging in extramarital affairs produced a decrease in happiness by 0.11 across both genders in the sample. Thinking about another person during intercourse was particularly negatively correlated to happiness in men, but was present in both genders as well. So yeah, don't cheat and uh, don't think about other people while you're having sex with your primary partner if you want to be happier. But the bad news bears don't stop there. Pain for sex lowered happiness scores in men by 0.22, and in the total sample by 0.14. On the subject of premarital sex, the only general finding across males and females of this study was in those who had paid for sex being less happy, but with men having no general negative side effects of premarital sex. So it doesn't really affect men too much if they had had multiple sexual partners before their marital partner. And in fact, actually increased their reported happiness by 0.15. 
In contrast, however, women reported a decrease of happiness of 0.28 from having had premarital sexual partners, and an astounding 0.98 decrease in happiness from having engaged in consumer sexual activity. That is typically being paid for sex, although it could be paying for sex, but it's women, come on, let's be honest, they were probably being paid for it, not the other way around. Looking for a date? Ten bucks or six Dairy Queen coupons. So what's the takeaway from this? Have a single partner, and if you're a woman, have as few partners as possible if you want to be happy. What does that have to do with pornography? Well, as I discussed, the more pornography, the greater promiscuity. The greater extramarital affairs, the more likelihood of having multiple premarital partnerships. Thus, knowing what we know about pornography exposure, many of these effects of happiness or upon happiness could potentially be associated with porn usage. This is not a direct correlation, I'm making associations here. For example, though, Wright 2012 conducted a longitudinal analysis far greater than the several days or even week-long experiments of his predecessors in the Zillman and Bryant studies, over a two-year period, asking participants about their personal pornography viewership with over a thousand participants, and found that prolonged exposure to pornography was associated with greater engagement in casual sex. But that behavior was moderated by reported personal unhappiness with one's life indicating potentially that people who use porn may engage in more casual sex, but only when they are also unhappy, though this whole thing raises a question of causality. Although this was a longitudinal analysis with time one and time two data collection, we can't still make causal claims about which came first. Were you unhappy because you were watching more porn and therefore you engaged in more casual sex? Or were you engaging in more casual sex because you were unhappy and you were unhappy and therefore you watched porn? We can't really figure out how these variables fit together. What we can say, though, is that we are definitely seeing a sort of correlation here between unhappiness and increased exposure to premarital or multiple partnership relationships. And ultimately, there is really no way to get at what causes what in this kind of complex environment. I mean, we can conduct these experiments, but as I mentioned in the first video, then you lose your external validity. <laughs> it isn't as quite applicable to the real world. What we can do, though, is look at the wealth of data we have and make some conclusions about this stuff, which is what I'm asking you guys to do. I'm probably not going to provide an answer. Just, you know, check it out. Hey, try it out, try it out, man. <laughs> But anyway, what we know so far is that people are potentially more likely to be unhappy when they use porn, or they use more porn because they are unhappy. And either way, something associated with unhappiness are these more deviant sexual lifestyles, which we also know is associated with higher porn use, given that it has been associated with various factors of promiscuity. Now, keep in mind what I mentioned in the first video, and I'm sorry I keep bringing it up and I split these, but it was just getting too long. We have seen a downwards trend in marriage in the United States and across the West. Now, there's plenty of reasons for this outside of pornography, that's for sure. I mean, how about the fact that the entire institution of marriage is massively biased against men and favors women almost unilaterally, no matter how incredibly fucked no matter how ironclad your prenup. But yes, generally speaking, we see lower rates of marriage and greater rates of single motherhood. So when we talk about long-term social outcomes, even if porn isn't the only variable, which of course I'm not saying it is, could it play a role? Let's keep going then. Christensen 2004, which is albeit a dissertation, and it is albeit a dissertation out of BYU, so despite all the significant findings that it may have forwarded as being poo-pooed by some media outlets, <laughs> I mean, it's not as if the Mormons are the masters of science or anything, generally speaking. In this connection, may I offer a suggestion to all of us? If we truly desire to know the prophet, we must go to the right source. And that is not a Google search. As President Ezra Taft Benson taught, today, with the abundance of books available, it is the mark of a truly educated man to know what not to read.
but it's still a university, and it doesn't mean you can just knock the data out of the park outright without taking a look at it. So I took a look at it. And what the study found was that the number of premarital sexual partners that a man had before his wife was negatively related to his marital sexual satisfaction, although not related to his general happiness and satisfaction. And that kind of supports the Chang and Smith findings about men not really seeming too bothered in their general lives and average happiness by fucking women before they get married. Christensen also found that, from his sample, men were considerably more likely to have more premarital partners than women. Specifically, they were more likely to have more than 10 partners than women. And even 2% of his sample reported having more than 60 premarital partners. Uh, just saying, I think maybe some of you guys are talking it up a little bit. How do you attract women? What is it, do you think? I don't know, I want to come tell you. But you've had, you've slept, well I, want, I wish you would. You've slept with a thousand women. Nah, between 30 and 40. Thousand? Between, nah, between 30 and 40 women. Tell right. my team a thousand. Nah, I didn't say, I said 30 and 40. 30 and 40. And, and what are they, what is it, what is it about him? What, what, I don't know. But the answer would be, if we don't find so much general unhappiness from premarital sexual partners in men, uh, maybe it's not absolutely terrible, right? I mean, interestingly, that result was confirmed in another doctoral thesis that I dropped some mad dosh, well, 40 dollar dues, to buy a copy of. That was fascinating to me because not a single one of the researchers' hypotheses were supported. This is Strauss 2012, who found absolutely no general dissatisfaction in men across any number of premarital sexual partners that they had before meeting their wives. Nor was there any decreased reported happiness based on perceptions of the man's wife's number of premarital sexual partners. Okay, so see, there we go. No problem at all. See, Aiden, maybe men are less sexually satisfied when they've fucked a lot of women before marriage, but uh, that's it. Other than that, they seem to be reporting being perfectly happy and normal. I mean, for fuck's sake, they don't generally appear to be less happy or satisfied even, even when their wife has taken a couple dozen different rides around the old cock carousel. And while I don't want to dismiss, because we should not, that less sexual satisfaction thing, because that could play a major role in why people get divorced. I mean, if a man isn't sexually satisfied, uh, yeah, he might not want to stick around. But when we talk about general or overall happiness, uh, guess what, lads? That really does appear to affect women. A lot. Rhodes and Stanley, 2014, in association with the National Marriage Project, found that having cohabitated with a single additional partner before marriage was associated with general lower marriage satisfaction and unhappiness in their general survey. But, given what we just learned, we can potentially surmise and infer that this general dissatisfaction probably originated mostly from women more than it did from men. I mean, if men aren't reporting general lower marital satisfaction when they've had more premarital sexual partners or have cohabitated, then, well, it makes sense that this finding would indicate it was coming from women. This is possibly supported by data from the National Survey of Family Growth, which found that women who had no prior partners before their husbands before their marriage were the least likely to divorce within five years, with the greatest number, unsurprisingly, of divorces being those women who had ten or more partners, and with those between three and nine being less likely to divorce than those who had two partners. But although two partnerships fell below three and nine overall, the trend seems fairly consistent. The more partners, the more divorce. Maybe you could say it indicates there's a kind of Goldilocks zone of sexual partners for women being ideal, with one being the greatest and ten or more being the danger zone. Abort, abort, abort. Oh no, we got a glitch. Abort the plan! Abort the surprise! Abort the babies! Everybody run! If some cocksuckers hadn't tried to chase Braving Ruin off of YouTube, he did an absolutely fantastic video on this topic and incels. Too bad I can't currently link it to you. Point is, the more sexual partners you have is correlated with greater sexual dissatisfaction in men, high unhappiness in women, ultimately higher divorce rates, and, my dear friends, what is associated with more sexual partners? Greater acceptance of promiscuity and infidelity, lower desire for children, and respect for the institution of marriage. 
Do you know the answer? Well, it's porn. Again, these are just sort of general associations. I don't have a specific study on this one, but... Hmm. Really makes you think. Do you know how much it bums me up and burns my ass to think that there could be media effects potentially this significant in the long term? Again, I'm in no way saying that porn is causing these massive social changes on its own, but it is something to consider. But let's move forward. We know extensive porn exposure is related to many of the same attitudes and behaviors that are further associated with unhappy marriages, with divorce. So, so far, it's looking as if it is possible that increased exposure to porn is a factor in long-term changes to society as porn use has gone up as access and ability to make deposits in the spank bank have become overwhelmingly easier with the advent of the internet and online pornography. And we hear about that a lot, don't we? The idea of internet porn addiction. Would it surprise you lads to know that it's actually not that well studied? At least not as much as I would have expected. But given what we've seen about this idea of prolonged exposure over time being the real cause of any changes in attitude or psychology or physiology in porn usage, we need to address this kind of question. Is there such a thing as porn addiction? Does it even real? Short answer, yeah, it does real. Gola et al. 2017 utilized fMRI data to examine the minds of men who self-reported as porn addicts. And by the way, we have to study this in self-reported addicts because any attempt to induce addiction is unethical as fuck. But anyway, they used fMRI data to look at the minds of men who considered themselves to be addicted to pornography. It's also important that they assessed men here, although in the future this is a relatively new study. I hope they do assess women as well, because although we see that men and women respond to porn similarly, and while both men and women use porn, men do at a higher frequency. And therefore, men as a populace are more potentially susceptible to the negative effects of being exposed to porn, and particularly the potentiality for porn addiction. The researchers found that men who self-identified as being addicted to pornography reacted with greater activity in the ventral striatum, with an increased response to exposure to erotic stimuli than in the control group that did not report being addicted. The ventral striatum is the portion of the brain associated with risk-taking for the purpose of gaining rewards. It's the reward center. And this area was more active in porn addicts when they were shown erotica than when they were shown indicators of financial gain, than when they were shown pictures of money. In other words, porn addiction, which seems to mimic similar addictions that are behavioral in nature, such as gambling, on some level prevents the mind from assessing the rational paradigm of disregard females acquire currency. I found a penny! Could this be the best day of my life? <laughs> Looks like we have a new champion. But I mentioned other forms of behavioral addiction. That's different from a chemical addiction, right? In terms of how addictions in general function in regards to the brain, they can be somewhat similar whether they're behavioral or chemical, because after all, we are looking at chemical processes. Nora Valkol describes it through a three-stage model of addiction with A, binge or intoxication, wherein the nucleus accumens, a section of the ventral striatum, is flooded with dopamine. Then B, withdrawal and negative affect, following this inundation of dopamine, wherein a portion of the extended amygdala associated with pain response actually becomes activated. In other words, you are filled with a sense of euphoria and then with a sense of pain or despair. And then thereby, finally, C, preoccupation and anticipation, with a strong craving to return to that earlier level and flood of dopamine. Dopamine is basically a natural drug that our brain produces to make us feel good. So it's no real surprise that when something induces a lot of dopamine, it's addictive. So for nature to ensure that we will go through the behaviors necessary in order to procure the food that is necessary for us to survive, it has linked to pleasure, to reward. Similarly, as it relates to reproduction, 
that behavior is associated with reward to ensure that the species will procreate. What happens though is that over time the addict comes to crave more and more dopamine response, and meanwhile the poor brain becomes less and less able to keep up with the dopamine levels desired causing the high to feel less rewarding every single time often. And what we found was that the brain of addicted individuals had a reduction in the levels of dopamine D2 receptors. These findings made me start to wonder whether something similar could be happening in obesity. And what we found was that just as for addiction, their brains had a reduction in the levels of dopamine D2 receptors. This is why, much like other behavioral addictions, such as eating addictions or gambling, porn addiction, much as we saw actually with the Zillman studies, eventually requires more and more and more extreme exposure as time goes on. Remember that habituation effect I mentioned last time on how more exposure over time was correlated with greater boredom with pornography and a higher desire to seek out novel types of porn? Well, that now makes a lot of sense from Volkel's addictive model, right? And moreover, we can actually see that happening in the brain of porn addicts. But it is in a unique way to porn use and in contradiction and contrast to other forms of behavioral addiction. Prowse et al. 2015 measured electroencephalographic recordings of male and female participants while exposing them to both sexual and non-sexual images in search of differences in late positive potential amplitude, which is associated with emotional responses. Across the entire sample, there was an increased LPP amplitude when exposed to sexual images. Everybody was kind of more emotionally stimulated when they were shown some porn. But interestingly, Participants who reported struggling with excess use of pornography had lowered responses in their LPP than those who did not. This actually runs completely counter to the research that has found increased LPP amplitude in cocaine addicts and gambling addicts alike, so both physical and behavioral addiction. This means that while porn use activates the same areas of the brain associated with other forms of addiction, it also possesses a unique habituation effect potentially that is in contrast to other forms of addiction in that, well, the same old, same old stops cutting it. It starts to become boring and it causes the addict to seek higher or more varied forms of porn. Gosh darn it, I sure do love when neuroscience backs up social science data. <laughs> Despite how absolutely kind of depressing that was. Shit. Fucking A. Let's, again, keep trucking though, right? We have talked about the differences between men and women in porn use. Men use more, but men and women use it for the same reasons, and have generally pretty similar reactions to it. But are there any other demographic differences that might be of interest to us today in understanding how porn affects us as individuals or as societies? Well, unsurprisingly, it's possible that politics and personality play a role although it may not be in the direction you would anticipate. Levert 2007 looked at Christian and non-Christian compulsive consumers of online pornography in association with a trait called right-wing authoritarianism. I mentioned this trait in just, I think, a video or two ago, and while it's highly flawed, it is often used as a representation or stand-in within research for what somewhat defines political conservatism. The factors of the trait concern conventionalist values, towards long-held norms, aggression typically towards outgroups, and general respect for authority figures. Like I said, this in no way well describes conservatism or right-wingers at large, but it tends to line up with other measures within the big five personality traits with other measures of conservatism, such as self-report or social dominance orientation. So even though it's not great to do on its own or be held on its own, Mm, you can make some inferences from it, potentially? Anyway, interestingly, Levert found that across both Christians and non-Christians, males higher in right-wing authoritarianism were more likely to be compulsive users of pornography than males lower in right-wing authoritarianism. Are you surprised? I kind of was. 
I mean, that seems a bit counterintuitive, right? In that the very nature of the RWA trait that I described is concerned with things like conventionalism. It's strange then that those who are high in that trait would be not so averse to socially non-conventional behaviors such as, well, you know, beating your meat to hentai. It's called hentai, and it's art. Again, it confounded me. But then I thought about it for a minute, and I mean, well, lads, just take a look at Paul. Is this true? Why getting off to anime porn is shorthand for supporting Donald Trump. Hell yeah, make anime great again. I go through phases where I fap to furry, then 3D, then hentai, then I fantasize women I know, and then loop back around. When I had a girlfriend I would only have sex with her when I was at her phase. I might have OCD goddammit. I haven't wanked it to 2D since I was 15. You you don't really jerk off to anime, do you? Like that's not a real thing, is it? And if you do it can't be exclusive, right? You are on the wrong website. All starting to make sense now, isn't it? Oh, I'm being punked, aren't I? It's worth pointing out that this study had kind of a questionable way of assigning participants into the Christian and non-Christian groups, with respondents asked to self-identify as Christian or non-Christian. That should pretty much be enough. But then the researchers asked those who did call themselves Christian by self-report a multiple-choice question on what it means to be Christian according to them. And they were disqualified from the Christian group and placed in the non-Christian group if they had an answer that was anything other than, quote, Christianity is Jesus is my Lord and Savior. So just saying, something to keep in mind here with these data. I read this study, it seemed a little bit iffy to me, but um, big if true, I guess? And completely explains 4chan. Interesting if true. Anyway. We're coming to the end of some of this, folks. What have we looked at so far? Some pretty fucked up shit. We know that there is an association between porn and greater promiscuity. We know there's associations with promiscuity, more sexual partners, and greater unhappiness. And we know that it not just is unhappiness for men in terms of their sexual satisfaction, but way for women and that ultimately it leads to greater divorce. So when we're looking at total changes in society and we see greater divorce rates, well, we could be looking at a trend here. But one thing I haven't really addressed yet, and one of the reasons I had to split these into two parts is because this shit's its own fucking topic, to be completely honest, is that going back to that initial proposal I mentioned in the outset, that pointless and stupid SPD youth proposal that, you know, asked for more feminist porn, which purported that exposure to non-violent, gay, fat porn is going to be good for the youth, based on all of the things that we have covered, is starting to look fairly silly and inaccurate. As, I mean, it always did, but more so now, right? But we didn't really get into that youth bit, because, again, that's a whole topic in and of itself. So look, we know now that massive exposure to porn increases acceptance of porn being distributed to minors. We saw this in the Zillman 1986 report to the Surgeon General. And that in and of itself is a bit mortifying. But why is it mortifying? Let's ask the question, is porn bad for kids? Well, right now, let me tell you, friend, there are no experimental data here. Nor should there be, nor ever will there be, because showing porn to kids is a violation of every ethical standard in the book for a reason. God, sometimes I really am thankful for the IRB. And, uh, I mean, maybe by that very nature that we can't study it because it's unethical, thereby it answers the question, is porn bad for kids? But, hang on, we need data. Maybe all of these university ethics boards are just a bunch of stuck-up old bigots, huh? Well, that doesn't mean we can't study it. Because what we do have are recollection studies. That means asking adults to think back to a time when, as children, they were exposed to porn and try to remember what it felt like or what their reaction was. Bryant and Rockwell, 1994, found that children who reported being exposed to erotic material between the ages of 13 and 14 developed a more accepting series of opinions on extramarital sex. 
but had no other seeming alterations on their perceptions of morality, similarly to what we saw in Zilman and Bryant's earlier work that showed that although exposure to sexual and erotic material made people more accepting of sexual immorality or misconduct, it had no effect on their perceptions of other supposedly moral behaviors, such as robbery or violence. Further, Strauss and Breckel Rothfuss, 1987, found that self-indicated exposure to sexually valenced music videos, even, in outlets such as MTV, was associated with more favorable attitudes in adolescents towards premarital sex. Particularly, this effect was strong in teenage girls. As mentioned earlier, most teens in the U.S. have been exposed to sexual content, somewhere between 80 and 100 percent by the age of 18. That exposure is not necessarily pleasant, though. We have just seen as above from these two studies that it potentially does have the same impacts as exposure to pornography on anyone else, and why would we expect it to be any different, to be completely fucking honest? Greater exposure, greater acceptance of promiscuity, and non-normative, or at least non-traditional, sexual behavior. Further, Sabina Wolock and Finkelhor, two Hor, fuck, 2008 found significant sexual differences between boys and girls who were exposed to pornography before the age of 18. In their study, 80% of boys and 27% of girls reported feeling excited by the exposure. So yeah, boys were at least interested in it. But in contrast, 73% of girls felt embarrassment about the exposure versus 25% of boys, with further 51% of girls and 20% of boys reporting disgust. Over two-thirds of both boys and girls with strong effect experiences described their feelings of being exposed as shock or surprise. Half of boys and about one-third of girls also felt guilt or shame. More or less equal numbers of boys and girls said that as a result of their exposure and the encounters that they were less eager to seek sexual activity, about 20% of boys and 22% of girls, and although that's a good thing, is that what we actually see happening in terms of long-term exposure. One-time exposure, maybe, but long-term, hmm, data seem to go the other way. Further, 25% of girls and 24% of boys reported having future unwanted or unpleasant thoughts about the experience of their exposure, and 15% of boys and 19% of girls reported that their exposure to pornography made them feel unattractive or inadequate. The quick and dirty, it doesn't appear to affect boys as seriously, but it does affect both sexes. All of the research I've seen on this seems to confirm this. Cantor, Moores, and Hyde, 2003, asked college students to consider their first experience with pornographic material before the age of 18, and found largely that they reacted with the following emotions. Disgust, embarrassment, shock, fear, and sadness. Pretty much the same shit. Of course, something to be aware of here is the potential for multiple confounds, the first being in recollection not being in any way experimental, but others being that there are all kinds of other reasons why children may be more likely to even be looking at porn in the first place. For example, Browning and Laum in 1997 on outcomes for victims of adult child sexual assault found that children who were victims of these horrible events tended to have more sexual partners, and a higher propensity for teen pregnancy, as well as a higher propensity for sexually transmitted diseases, indicating that children who are the victims of assault tend to be more sexual from an early age. So <sighs> there is some horrible possible confound there. And further, Keynes 1991 found that 78% of sex addicts that he studied came from disengaged families of origin, indicating though, as with the Browning and Laumann study actually, that there is a cyclical nature of sexual dysfunction, meaning that if you are sexually dysfunctional, if you engage in a whole lot of sexual activity, it's very likely your children will too. Actually, we can see that in that women who are teen mothers are more likely to breed teen mothers. God, that's a horrible way of fucking saying it. Fuck Aiden. But moreover, Keynes, in his model of sexual addiction as a process, emphasizes the importance of feelings of shame on the eventual development of addiction to sex. Shame. That kind of thing I just mentioned above a couple of times. I'm not saying witnessing porn as a child is the same as sexual assault in terms of how it affects the psyche, not in the least. 
but that it potentially has the same kind of effect on sexual and mental development as anything else does to children. And given what we know about exposure to pornography leading to higher promiscuity and decreased perceptions of the importance of family, marriage, children, fidelity, and the long-term negative effects that those all have on happiness and positive outcomes potentially leads in long-term, longitudinal, and cyclical changes in attitudes, behaviors, and ultimately, society at large. Can I give you an answer? No, but shit, man. It doesn't look really good here, does it? As I mentioned earlier, we only have recollection data, as it is unethical to expose children to pornography in an experimental design. Thus, friends, I cannot provide you with any truly empirical data on this subject from an experimental stance. But what I can do in contrast is show you something that is uh, completely and utterly anecdotal, but which I believe complements the aforementioned data, with a few clips from this video, from The Cut, called Parents Explain Masturbation. This is to simulate an erect penis, right? Yeah. Right? A hard penis. That's why you don't need a boy. You can get a penis anywhere. <laughs> Perhaps a good number of you have seen this video or seen it referenced as it was covered by a number of commentators or shall I call them skeptics. skeptics. But I want to bring it up again here, even though it's over a year old now, because the reactions of embarrassment, disgust, shock, and shame are precisely what are reflected on the faces and in the body language of these kids who are being shown sex toys. Now, I suppose you could say, well, Aiden, there's the problem right there. The reason these kids feel so uncomfortable is because they just haven't been exposed to enough government-funded porn. Uh, yeah, maybe, except, you know, who are the parents here exactly? They're not really the religious right conservatives who suddenly one day went from preaching about how Jesus cries when you touch your willy to this. There's like a little thing that's called the clitoris, and you can touch it and kind of stimulate your body, no. and it makes you feel good. No. One day. This is an ongoing pattern of parenting behavior, I'm fairly sure. And if you thought this was just a question being raised in Germany by a student party, think again, as unsurprisingly, UC Santa Barbara, where the fuck else would it originate from, sex info online website, which is operated by UCSB students, encourages parents to let their children watch porn as a process of sexual exploration. I guess at least they're not calling for the state to fund it, but is not the result probably the same? I can provide you with the statistics all day long, but I think actually seeing the visceral response of these kids is more telling about how abnormal of an exposure this is. Now, yes, there is something called social learning theory that posits that children learn, obviously, from watching their parents. And thereby, that's how we get all of these explanations that uh, sexism and gender roles are all socially constructed. They don't exist in any other way. Men and women are exactly the same. Dogs flew spaceships, all that fucking shit. But social learning occurs by watching the parents. Look at who these parents are. And you don't even have to look further at how awkward and embarrassed the children are in and of themselves to understand how weird this is. The video creators were apparently aware <laughs> externally of how incredibly inappropriate this video was because they fucking censored out the big floppy pink dildo for the discerning innocent YouTube audience, but didn't consider that you can't apply a mosaic filter in real life. Okay, so let's go over what we've talked about. Porn can be addictive. It changes our attitudes and potentially our behaviors in potentially antisocial ways, at least when we talk about the long-term health of society. It can maybe mess children up by scarring them a bit, but can it affect the body outside of the kind of basic heart rate and systolic blood pressures that we talked about earlier? Well, yeah, potentially. Weaver et al. 2015, in an analysis of mental and physical health effects of exposure to sexually explicit material, 
found negative effects in correlation to use of pornography, with, again, unsurprisingly, 78% of their sample of heavy porn users being male. Specifically, though, the researchers found that high use of pornography was associated with a greater likelihood of depression, lower health status in general, both physical and psychological, and reported lower average life quality across both male and female participants. Interestingly, though, high user women reported lower mental health and quality of life in general than did their male counterparts, although the findings were uniform in terms that it went down in both sexes in this negative relationship. This is, again, just more evidence of the potential negative outcomes of long-term exposure to pornography. Where are we at now? Physical, psychological, and society level, potentially. So, what was this all about? What's it all about, Mr. and Mrs. John Q. Smith from Anytown, USA? Well, it's about this long. And about that wide. And it's about this country. About which we're singing about. Well, it's about whether or not state-funded pornography is a good thing. But generally, too, it's about is pornography a good thing at all? Look, ultimately, I'm still a hapless libertarian who believes in the maximization of personal freedoms. Matt, I think I could stand up there for the whole debate and not say anything and, and emerge as a leader. So, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I don't care what you ingest, be it media or you know, something else, for the most part. And besides, the porn industry is booming and therefore good for the economy, I guess. But I do have to pause and say, hang on, wait a minute. Maybe this shit is pretty awful for society. Even if it is, I'd still say, bombs away, you do you, boo. But wow we, if we're looking at social trends, it seems very possible that porn has something to do with that. It's easy. And that's the point. Porn's not love, is it? Excessive porn use seems to be, in summation, pretty much negative for the psyche, the body, and society, at large, and in excessive amounts. It seems to increase perceptions of women asking for rape, and I'll state that one first to appease the single imaginary feminist viewer who managed to make it this far, but no, no they didn't. That marriage and children are undesirable, particularly female children. That promiscuity and infidelity are okay, if not even desirable. Further, excessive viewership causes habituation and ultimately boredom with normative sex and sex acts, causing increased interest, potentially, in deviant sexual activity, including other acts of promiscuity, such as S&M and filthy fur faggotry. I have, don't really have a problem with the former, but the latter needs to burn with fire. I asked him, will you ever date your mom? And he said, well, you date your son? I said, in honest truth, yes, I would. We're both consenting adults if... If uh, it comes down to it, you know, it's just like the gays. They're Further, greater porn exposure meant more acceptance of allowing children and general audiences to be exposed to porn. But, as we've seen, children respond quite negatively to that exposure. Despite the general interest of boys in it, it's still probably not a good thing. We also see that porn is potentially addictive, as are other repetitive behaviors, like gambling, and that it can potentially have long-term negative physical effects on the body and the mind. But most worrisome is the potential long-term social outcome given that increase in promiscuity and in sexual liberation, leading to more partners, which in turn is correlated to higher divorce rates in women, and lower sexual satisfaction in men. And while again, I'm not saying one variable is in any way responsible for this, the results may seem to align with the social trends that we've seen since the sexual revolution, with a decrease in marriage, a hump <laughs> in divorce rates during the 80s through the early 2000s, a massive increase in single motherhood, and lower general reproductive rates across every single population involved in our society. All potentially just, of course. As I've said many times, looking at any one variable is unlikely to provide an adequate solution describing any massive changes in society. That's just silly. 
but it seems as though pornography might be a possible contributor to these changes in demography. In conclusion, do I think porn is bad and should be outlawed or something? Fuck no. Uh, do I think it's bad? Generally, no, but again, it's everything in moderation. I don't think much of anything is bad in small doses. Uh, I mean, you know, heroin and all that. <laughs> yeah. But it does seem as though there may be some aspects of pornography that contribute to general increases in sexual promiscuity, infidelity, more premarital sexual partners, and therefore ultimately divorce, lack of interest in marriage, child rearing, and other numerous mental and physical health aspects that could explain some of the trends we see in society. Am I going full Varg Vilkerns and saying, stop masturbating? Sluta kolla på porr. Cesse de regarder de la pornographie. Slut och se på porn. Stop kigge på porno. Stop watching porn. No, I am saying though that maybe, just maybe, porn hasn't had a really awesome effect overall on society, at least when consumed in massive quantities. Then again, what vice has, except for alcohol? That one is a society builder. Gentlemen, today we Ireland's top scientists have found a way to convert our entire population to pure energy. Oh, oh, it's a glorious day. Day. oh absolutely. Hey, Michael McLeod's just invented a new kind of beverage in his basement. Hmm, whiskey. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> <crazy>. <laughs> Still, as always, though, I'm a libertarian, so I say do what you want, friend, but it might just be something to consider for your own personal life and for the life of society at large. If you are feeling particularly unhappy, if you're feeling like you're in a rut, maybe it really is that no fap might help you. Was porn a mistake? I don't know, maybe. Again, generally probably no more than any other vice was a mistake, because if you remove it, people will just find some other way to access it. But what I can say is that there is sufficient evidence to suggest that the government should not be funding pornography for the purpose of public distribution, since, again, they don't cover any of those other vices. I mean, for fuck's sake, in terms of the original proposal, recreational marijuana isn't even legal in Germany, let alone government subsidized. <laughs> I mean, sure, I don't think the government should pay for much of fucking anything, taxation is theft and all, but particularly something as potentially detrimental as porn should not be floated on the government penny, at least not based on these extensive data that I've tried to provide over this little mini-series. If you've enjoyed it, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm Aiden Paladin, Altonavolt. Here's the deal. Try it out, try it out, man. Try it out, man. I'm just looking for some hot black guys that mean it and wanna do it. Wanna do it, wanna do it. Cause I'm a cum dump. I hope you thugs come and try it out, man. Try it out, man. Try it out, man. Whether you're in jail or fucking homeless, it doesn't matter cause I got a mental illness. I got a mental illness, Tom. If you wanna move.